before you go to decide on what bike you're going to ride, what position you're going to ride it in, whether you're going to fit or not, I think it's really important to work out why do we go fast on a bike, why do we go slow on a bike. So we're going to walk you through a bit of the science of cycling. So first thing we're interested in is, and I hope you can guess from here, body weight. Okay, so we're going to talk about the three, to me, the three key principles of, of what makes you go fast and slow. Body weight is one of them. You know, and guess what the next one is? Wind resistance. Okay. Now, we're going to talk a bit about that as triathletes because it's pretty damn important. Okay. And the third one really is technology. The more money you spend, the faster you ride, obviously, because that's more high tech. So, you know, getting these sort of things around. Now, we're going to try and rip through this. We don't have a lot of time to get through what we want to tonight there. So, we're looking at resistance here. Have a bit of a read through that if you can read it here. Now, I think the one that I talk about again and again is point number two there. So we're talking about going from a three or $4,000 bike to an eight or $9,000 bike. We're going from seven and a half kilos to six and a half kilos. Dropping that one kilo, assuming you're the leanest athlete you can possibly be, which obviously we all are in this room. Dropping that one kilo, if you're doing 40 k's now, which obviously a reasonably quick leg, over an hour you're gonna save one second. So always good to have a bit of a think about that. So Time trialling on most of the courses, certainly on the Bustleton course, the Mandra course, time trialling is, is not about weight, okay? So the bigger cyclists in here, it's good news. It's good news. Running is more of a problem there. The tendon boys will talk about that, okay? So start climbing hills. Start being a 58 kilo hill climber doing 3,000 k's through France. We've seen enough Tour de France that have been decided by seconds. You know, every second counts there. And you can see that as you start going up a hill, those distances by saving that kilo start becoming much more important there. Okay, this is where we're talking about for triathletes. It's about wind resistance. Okay, 70 to 90% of the resistance moving forward on a flat surface is wind resistance. So this is where, and I say again and again, you don't get many free things in triathlon, but you can get free speed if you're in the right position. Okay, if you're in the right position. Now, we'll talk more about the factors that allow you to get into that position as we move forward here. So, then you look at your rolling resistance, which is that combination of weight and tyres and tyre pressure and bits and pieces there. Transition uh, resistance, Dura Ace versus 105, little things like that. You know, but you can do the maths. Air resistance is what's really, really important there. And that bike position affects that hugely. Coming through here again now, I guess most of us as triathletes or as cyclists have spent some time doing some bunch riding and, b and spent some time out in the road in a, uh, on the time trial bikes or on the freeway bike path there. So really, really interesting. You know, in a peloton on a bunch, we can save up to 40%. There's some signs of 50% of a saving if you're in the right spot in a peloton. There was a Tour de France stage a couple of years ago that I haven't seen it as hard evidence, but anecdotally I've heard that one guy averaged 98 watts for a 200 kilometre stage. So his team was pretty carefully resting him, hiding him in the bunch, didn't even average more than 100 watts over a whole stage. So that, wind, that peloton effect is pretty damn significant. It really, really is there. Now, what is particularly interesting for you guys who are going to be 12 metres apart is there is actually still a reasonably significant effect. The bigger the person in front of you and the faster you're going, the bigger the effect because of that angular, angular slide we showed you there. So. You know, there's some certainly suggestions of you can be saving between 20 and 50 watts, depending how fast you're going, depending how big you are, even at 12 metres. And so you'll see the pros, and you'll see the times the pros will do there, and don't for a moment think it's a pure time trial. Okay, listen, there's often one guy on the front who might be doing it, but, you know, the pros you, you might find will gently, gently wind their way through. They've got to be careful, and the draft busters know what they're trying to do. But you'll also, you watch them and chatting to James Lewin about it the, the other day, you, you watch them coming out of the water and you don't think they're ripping through a transition as fast as they can to get on the back of that train that's happening there. And you know, it, it, it's pretty, pretty important stuff there. So I was surprised to find it was that, that bigger numbers there. No really hardcore studies, but there's a few people who have used power meters to do a pretty, pretty, pretty good stuff on this now. So keep that in mind. Now, when we start talking about what position do we want to be on a bike, we're looking at optimising how your body will function on a bike. Not how James's body functions on Merv's bike or vice versa there. It's about how you move, what you're trying to achieve, 
comfort a really important thing. Kate talks about it again and again. You know, if she had an option to choose between comfort and aero, she'll pick comfort any day. You know, the confidence you have when you feel good on a bike, the knowledge you've got to get off and run 21 or 42 k's or however long afterwards, they're so, so important there. But you've still got to run when you get off, off it there.